Well, good morning, Christchurch family. It's great to be with you on this video and to be able to share God's word with you this morning. We send greetings from Thailand uh, to every single one of you. Pray God's blessing and grace upon you at this time. It's a privilege to be able to share from the Gospel of Mark and the story that's been uh, read to us already. Thank you for that reading. And I'm speaking from that text on the topic of serving like Jesus, serving like Jesus. And um, as I begin, I want to share a little story from when I was growing up. I grew up in Kenya in a family with seven children. And sometimes mealtimes were pretty crazy in our home. And uh, seating at mealtimes was a really hotly debated topic, especially when uh, one particular one of my siblings was born, a uh, little baby boy, baby brother, and, and it became very popular to be seated next to him. And so a struggle kicked off uh, where different ones would, different ones of us, me included, would sort of squabble and fight over getting to sit next to him. And it was a ridiculous struggle, but at that time it felt like a really big deal. So we would argue over it and there were tears shed and... Uh, who would get to sit next to him and so on. And in a bid to address our endless uh, squabbling, my dad came up with a little song and he would sing this song right when we'd be having our, our arguments. And the song went something like this. I am sitting beside Jesus. And the aim of the little song was to remind us that the greatest privilege is to be seated next to Jesus and not to fight over sitting next to the baby. Needless to say, the song did not work at all. And <laughs> it was years before we managed to figure out our squabbling and get our mealtimes more peaceful. But the story told in our reading today reminds me a little bit of that dynamic. And it's a similar struggle for the best seats uh, in the house. But in this case, it's James and John trying to get to secure their place sitting next to Jesus in glory. And they, too, were pretty childish and self-centered and somehow convinced that they had a legitimate reason to be seated next to the God of heaven. Our world is caught up in an endless struggle to gain advantage or supremacy or superiority over others. Ever since the beginning, men have sought to lord it over women and, and two women over men. Um, the rich strive for riches to gain position over the poor. The educated look down on those who studied less. The white look down on the black. Or maybe it's the Chinese looking down on the Japanese. Or Protestants on Catholics or Muslims on Christians or Christians looking down on Muslims or those who are so-called well-spoken, looking down on those with regional accents, and on and on, a list of endless positions we take, looking down on others. And into this, the madness of that never-ending fight for position and power, Jesus, the Son of Man and the Son of God, came with a new and a radical message. And his message was that the kingdom was being established by a king, he was that king, who let go of all his claims to greatness and let go of his position and came to serve those who were his creation. He came to redefine greatness. That was really one of the core tenets of his mission and one of the core values of his kingdom. He came to give his own life for those he had made, though they hated him. And he invited them, or really he invited us, to be like him. We are to follow in his steps, that example that he set. So our reading today begins with what we now can see was a really laughable attempt by James and John to cement their position as being closest to Jesus. More than that, they wanted to have a place either side of him in glory. They had recently been up the Mount of Transfiguration with him, just the two of them and Peter. So they were sure they were in the inner circle. They knew that Jesus valued their friendship and their companionship. They also had huge respect for him as their teacher. They called him rabbi. 
and they could see that he was a man sent from God. They referred to him as teacher. And they were also beginning to grasp that a time was coming where he would be glorified and he would be taken back up to heaven. They had been there just a short time earlier when Peter had said, you are the Christ. Jesus had asked, who do people say I am? And and finally, Peter answered and said, well, Jesus, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And they had heard Jesus say, don't tell anyone, don't go around saying that. And they knew it was true. In fact, it was dawning on them that they, the disciples, were discovering probably the greatest discovery in all of human history, the Messiah had come, the anointed one from God, and he was soon going to establish his kingdom. But they were desperately wrong in how they conceived of his kingdom. They were looking for position seated next to Jesus. So in a display, a shocking display of arrogance and and self-centeredness, they had that audacity to ask if they could have the places of greatest honor in glory with Jesus. And when he questioned them about, about this, about whether they could hack it, about whether they could pay the price that would be needed to sit in those places of honor, they recklessly insisted that they could. It's, it's almost a humorous little line in the story when they say, we can, of course we can. They had the notion what they were talking about. They were clueless. They were naive. They were self-focused. And they completely misunderstood Jesus' vision and values. But tellingly, Jesus didn't use this as an opportunity to put them to shame. In fact, when the other disciples found out what James and John had asked for, and they were furious, and they were indignant, and I think they were jealous, basically, not so much because they thought the question that had been asked was inappropriate, but because they would have wanted to be the one sitting next to Jesus. So when they discovered and they were indignant, Jesus doesn't look for an opportunity to take James and John down a peg or two. In fact, he brings words of correction and of instruction to all of them, not just James and John. Jesus was not tempted by pride in that moment to try to assert something about his position, his unique glory in the presence of the Father. Instead, he takes it as a teachable moment and patiently sets out for them a completely new vision of what greatness and leadership looks like. And they are shocking statements that Jesus makes. His is a vision of leaders who are first of all humble, servants. Leadership had never been cast in those terms before in history. And here is Jesus showing that leadership is not about power grab, whether it's leadership in the home or leadership anywhere else. Those with the desire to be great are those who would live for the sacrificial service of everyone else around them. That's the biblical vision of greatness. Well, this is the same vision that Jesus has for us today. It's the same vision of servant-heartedness and greatness that Jesus has for Christ Church, for, for you, uh, part of that church. And it's an undimmed vision. 2,000 years has not caused this topic to shift to the edges of Christian living, even though, sadly, as the body of Christ, too often, we are not presenting a picture of a servant-hearted people who are laying down our lives for Christ and for the world. At times we do, but at times we fail badly in this area. In our day and age, the longings of the human heart are still driven by a desire for position and prestige and power even if it's only just in our own little circle of influence, maybe in our home or our, our wider family or our neighborhood, that desire is still strong. But it's also extremely evident in, in the spheres of society that we know, like business and government and in the church. 
and in education and in the home, of course. Every field, every walk of life, it's there. It's even there where pastors are longing to have the biggest church or the, the most amazing ministry with the, the greatest markers of success. It's there, that desire is there. And husbands who leave the harder and more unpleasant work of the home to their wife over and over again. It's there in the rat race that drives so many of us to want the bigger salary, the, the better house, the, the more affluent neighborhood. It's riddled all through our society, a desire for what the world calls greatness or what the world calls uh, lording it over or leading others. Into the midst of this, Jesus speaks that vision again. He challenges us with that vision of his style of leadership. And he says, if you would be great, you must be the servant of others. If you long to be first, what first now means is you strive to be a slave of those around you. It's a shocking word for Jesus to use. The word slave has so many negative connotations. It's a terrible concept to have slaves. But I think Jesus was mindful of that meaning. I don't think he was using it as a euphemism. I think he meant that. Slaves in those days had no rights. They had no options. They had no leverage or leverage that they could use to improve their lot in life. Their choice was to serve or die. That, those were the options. Keep serving your master or be beaten and punished and ultimately be killed. Jesus is calling us to serve and die. He's calling us to be those servants all through the New Testament, not just in this story. The call, the command is to serve him and to serve others with our whole hearts not just when it's convenient, to die to ourselves, to die to selfish ambition, to that within us, which like James and John, would dearly like to be seated in the place of power and the place of uh, closest position next to Jesus. Instead, out of our love for Jesus, the Jesus who came and showed us how to live, we too choose to live for others to spend our lives for others. He calls us in the words of the song to bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the servant king. So what does this kind of serving look like practically? How does it demonstrate itself? What does it look like to be the slave of all? Well, first of all, serving is costly. Serving is about being willing to give ourselves, our time, our energy for the sake of others, even when it's not convenient. It's not just about being polite, doing that which is expected within the culture. It's going the second mile to serve. And more than the second, the, the third and the fourth and the fifth, however long God leads us to keep serving and helping others, even when it hurts to sacrifice for their sake. A second marker of what serving looks like is it's marked by a Christ-like attitude. This is the great distinctive of Christian service as opposed to excellent humanitarian activities. Christ-like service is marked by a joyful attitude and a willing spirit that is doing it unto God. David prays in Psalm 51 verse 12, grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Serving and sacrificing is a total nightmare if it doesn't come from a heart that chooses to do it joyfully and willingly. A third point about serving is that it's not just for when it's absolutely necessary. When, when the other options have been exhausted, okay, I'll step in and serve. No, serving others means being willing to pay the price for them to be blessed even when they could or perhaps they should do it themselves. I've experienced this in our family where our kids will ask me to do something, even something as basic as fetch them a cup of water or get something for them from their room. And instantly in my mind comes the thought, you could do that. Why, why do I need to get that for you? Why do I need to get you a cup of water? The heart of Christ 
looks to serve even when the other could do it for themselves. But a serving heart is willing even when it's not necessary. A fourth point, we don't serve to impress God or others. Serving is not about trying to curry favor with God, nor is it to prove that we really are like Jesus or to demonstrate the quality of our Christian nature. Ulterior motives like that are the exact same failure that James and John exhibited, what they were guilty of. It's just dressed up differently. It's the same point. It's a selfishness. True Christian service is unto Christ, even if others don't know or they don't appreciate it. A fifth quality of serving is that it's led by the Holy Spirit. A practical expression of Christian service is that it's doing it led by the Holy Spirit. Now, serving is not about doing anything and everything that's there to be done, but it is a willingness to do anything and everything that needs to be done. The willingness of spirit is the bedrock of the serving heart. But at the same time, the heart of the servant looks at what needs to be done and says, Lord, may I serve in that place? May I contribute? May I play a part in that? And many times God will lead us to serve. It might be in the life of the church, it may be in the home, it may be in other contexts to give of ourselves. Giving sometimes even more than we think we can manage in the natural. There's so many examples. I know many of you would have stories of serving and you thought you could only do it for a short time, but needs continue to arise and you keep serving and keep serving and maybe very difficult, maybe quite costly, but you find yourself able to continue by the grace of God and able to manage. Other times we will sense God's leading to not step in and serve, maybe to do something that we would have thought we should do. We would have assumed I, I should play a part in that. I'm surely I should be the one that steps in there and answers that need. There are times when God will lead us by the Holy Spirit not to be the one that's the answer. So there is a need for sensitivity to the Holy Spirit in the process. We need to practically seek God's leading and direction about what we are to do. Sometimes that discernment comes very easily and quickly when help is asked and, and we know that with joy I can step in and serve in that area. There's other times where a longer period of prayer and seeking God is needed. A sixth characteristic, uh, practical characteristic of serving is that serving is not relative to what others are doing. Uh, a Christ-like servant heart doesn't look to see how much have others done. And I, I want to be roughly in and around what they're doing or maybe a little bit more. No, serving for us as the people of God is relative to what Christ has done. He himself said, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve. He's our example. He's our type. And so as we look to his example there is no limit to the extent to which it's appropriate for us to serve. He calls us now to follow him and to walk in his steps. And the seventh characteristic is that we are serving like a slave. And of course, I don't mean the, the evil aspects of that term, but I think what the scripture is talking about here is the heart of a slave never assumes there's anything that's too difficult or beneath them. The slave could have been asked to do anything in the life of the owner, whether it's a menial task or a difficult task or a challenging task, and the answer would always have been yes. Yes, I will do that, master. And that is to be the posture of the believer towards Christ. Not that we are being oppressed at all by God. That's, that's the, the evil side of slavery. But that willingness from us to say, of course, Jesus, my answer to you, not so much to humans, but to you is always yes. That's why we're serving unto him and not unto others. So there's nothing that's beneath us, whether it's cleaning the toilets thankfully, uh, thanklessly and joyfully, whether it's doing the washing up for the umpteenth time, whether it's joyfully serving somebody who seems to appear at your home at mealtimes uh, every single day or every single weekend, 
or maybe things much harder than that, maybe spending years caring for somebody who's not even a relative, or whatever it might be, there are all kinds of ways that we will be called upon to serve that could seem like they are beneath us or too much to do. But for one who is a slave unto Christ, there is nothing that's beneath us. So these are seven characteristic, practical uh, characteristics of serving and of the servant heart. Now, it'll be obvious as I've shared those things that there's no way we can live this out of our own strength. So we must cry out to God to help us and to give us his heart and his energy to serve others by the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us. Not our own power. I, I bear witness to there being so much service that goes on at Christ Church. I know many of you are serving all across the life of the church and in your homes and families and workplaces. I've seen Steve vacuuming the floors uh, hundreds of times or Magda cooking again a beautiful meal for people in the life of the church and even those outside. Or maybe it's Bob putting out the Bibles or maybe it's Josh running tech and leading worship all at the same time again. Or maybe it's the entirety of Tim's ministry at Christ Church. I think you came just in time to lead the church through this period of COVID and what an, a, an outpouring of service your ministry has been in the church. Whatever it looks like, I know there is this endless service being poured out as a gift offering to Christ in the church. So I applaud these moments of Christ-motivated service for others. And I urge you, I urge us to press on in God, to be led by his spirit to serve even more and with greater joy, to serve with purpose and passion as unto him. As the scripture says, whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord and with the wholeness of the fullness of your heart, serving not only when others see you and will praise you, but also sometimes when it's unseen and thankless, but we're doing it as unto the servant king. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, what a perfect example you are the Son of Man, the Son of God, you came and gave your life for us. You didn't come to be served. By rights, you should have been served the entire time. The whole of your uh, ministry and life on earth should have been spent being weighted on hand and foot, but that's not how you lived. We pray that you would lead us to be many Christs in our homes, with our spouses, with our children, with our parents, with family members, and then beyond our homes in all the places where you call us, that we would be serving as unto the Lord, as unto Christ, with the best of our ability, obeying you in everything that you call us to do, even things which in the natural might seem impossible or beyond us or too much. God helping us by the power of the Holy Spirit, may we be enabled to render those acts of sacrificial offering and sacrifice to you. We praise you and bless you. I thank you for every member of the church and for all the service that's going on in that place. We ask for your help in this, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all.